The next section is called Assignment of the Floor in Debate. This is chapter 12. So, um, and th this is good knowledge for both a chair and for people who are in the assembly uh, because you, you need to know when you have the right to be recognized. So members must be recognized before they can make motions or speak in debate. So this is one of the foundational duties of a chair is that they control the flow of, um, uh, of business on the floor and they recognize people to speak. And you need to be recognized to uh, speak before you start speaking. Um, there's a few exceptions for that. Um, uh, but that's the, the basic rule. Um, and having said that, the chair must recognize any member who seeks the floor when entitled to it. So when there is no business on the floor, you can raise your hand and uh, introduce motions. Um, and once you have, have stated your motion, whatever it is, the chair should state for what purpose does the member rise, which is the formal way of saying, you know, what do you want? Um, and then you should either uh, state your motion or you know, suggest them they turn on the air conditioning or whatever the issue is that you want to speak. Uh, next slide, obtaining the floor. When the floor, when, when assigned the floor, a member may use it for any purpose, any proper purpose. Uh, no member who has already had the floor in debate on the immediately pending question is entitled to it again on the same day for debate on the same question, so long as a member who has not spoken on that question claims the floor. So that's a lot of words. Um, but we've all been in meetings where um, the chair lets the debate between two people go on interminably and the rest of the group really would like to move on, but everyone's sitting there and they're so polite that they don't want to, you know, offend anyone. Um, but this is one of those rules where it helps control that. So there's a couple other rules about speaking. Um, but what this one says is that you can't speak on something when someone else wants to speak about it. It prevents people from hogging the floor. Uh, the next slide under obtaining the floor, if possible, the chair should alternate between those favoring and those opposing the measure. So if you have a small enough group and the chair is pretty much familiar with how everyone feels and, you know, the, the issue of the state fair booth has come up one more time, uh, it would be great if the chair could sort of suss out who we're for and who is against and then choose uh, alternating op opinions. So everyone gets a sort of a balanced input of the information so that they, when they vote, they can, they can base it on a balanced set of information. Um, the practice that we sometimes see is that there's, there's this rule that uh, you line up in two, two queues, one for and one against, and when you run out of a speaker in one, the others have to stop speaking. This is a curtailment of debate and it has to be codified in a special rule that um, um, is written down in the rules of order uh, along with the bylaws. Um, and it has to be passed by a two thirds vote because it is an abridgment of your right to speak. Um, I think I need to research this and where we're currently encountering that. But uh, just because there's, there's 15 people that want to speak in favor of the fair booth and there's only one person that wants to speak against it doesn't mean that the other 14 people can't speak because you have the right to speak about it. And if it's not balanced, it just means that more people are in favor of the fair booth than against, but, uh, but they can't be uh, held back from speaking. A question on that, Larry, because you're defining a process I kind of watched at the convention right, where, where Valdez Bravo went back and forth between pros and cons on different um, legislative items or uh, action items. But um, it, can, can, the, can they limit? Like, okay, we have 400 people on either side. We really don't need to hear 400 testimonies. Let's limit it to this many and move on. Or is Not that... if the assembly has not agreed to that rule. Yeah. Okay. So if the assembly agrees to that by a two-thirds vote, yeah, you can impose those kinds of limits. But in the absence of those things. A chair can't set up, stand up there and say, oh, you know, it's four o'clock. We only have the room until 4.15. 
uh, we got to speed it up. So we're going to do this. They can't do, they can do that and you can be sheeple and let them do that. But uh, you can also object to it and say point of order. Uh, it is inappropriate for you to make those kinds of limitations on the speech. Very cool. Thank you for that clarification. And just one other thing that you might be addressing already, and please do it later if it is, but these rules are for members. When we have somebody like, like there's a great video of the, the uh, guy addressing the Seattle City Council after they folded, you know, and he starts off, hey, bootlickers, which I don't know if that has anything to do with Robert's rules, good or bad, but it, are there any rules of these that apply to just the citizen going to a council meeting that we can use or, you know what I mean? Well, um, uh, so in a council meeting, the assembly is the five council members and the public is there to observe. And so in those circumstances, um, uh, they open up debate to the floor and allow people to come up and, and make comments. And then they close uh, the comment period from the floor and then they go back to debating amongst themselves. Okay. So in those circumstances, it's the council that is the assembly. All right. All right. And, and no, they can't use terms like boot, bootlicker because <laughs> that is a breach of decorum. By by the citizens or by the council? Uh, it's inappropriate to use terms like bootlicker <laughs> because you, what you really are debating ideas and concepts and you try to keep the motion, the emotion out of the meeting so you can make rational decisions based on fact. Well, that's not fun. I like the way the Brits do it better. They I insult know. each other and yell at each <laughs> other. And quite frankly, the entire city council deserved to be called bootlickers. So it's kind of appropriate. What happens when it's factual? Never mind. Moving on. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, when a member has been assigned the floor and has begun to speak, they cannot be interrupted by another member or by the chair, except for a limited number of exceptions. So you have the right to speak. If you have the floor, you have the right to speak. Any questions of that material before we go to the next chapter? No, everybody's just having a good discussion about um, options. Would I have to go to law school to be able to know this? So, or, so I don't need to go to law school, Schultz says. No, you don't. Just need to read a, a book and practice, I guess. And interestingly, you know, that sometimes people make the assumption that this is material taught in law school, but attorneys never study parliamentary procedure. They study law, which is a whole different thing. Parliamentary procedure is about democracy and the implementation of democracy, and they never crack the book on this material. So I think that was one of the mistakes that was made um, uh, in the appointment of a chair of the Rules Committee because the appointment was an attorney but she had she didn't even own a copy of Robert Schulz's order when she got the position, and she said, "Oh well, I'll just wait for the um, the uh, the e version to come out." Well, unfortunately, the Roberts Foundation that controls this stuff is not that hip, and there's no e version coming out <laughs> imminently. I think she finally relented and got a copy, but uh, no, just because you have a law degree and you went to law school doesn't mean you know anything about the principles of democracy. Yeah. Uh, real quick in the audience, they're talking about Bavarian politics. I'm not sure why. Um, and, and Jeffrey Pearson wants to learn uh, this of Bavarian, Bavarian politics. Um, and, and just so everybody is aware, the cover is not our Congress, although it would be great if they were this active. Most of our Congress is sleeping. They have like a nappy rule. But um, this is the Ukrainian government, and I'm fairly certain this is a breach of Robert's rules in some way. <laughs> so. You're referring to the picture. Yes, yes, I showed you a picture. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Move the on. next chapter is rules governing debate. And this is chapter 12, uh, starting on page 385. So the right to speak cannot be interrupted except by a two thirds vote. Um, and the way this is done, and you know, if you've been to any of these meetings, you've heard people call, shout out the word question. Well, there's a process for doing this, which must be adhered to if you want. So the whole thing of calling the question means uh, let's, let's end debate and go to a vote. And it's often abbreviated to the word question that's shouted out. However, if you want to 
end debate and call the question. You have to raise your hand and be recognized by the chair. And then uh, two thirds of the members have to agree. If the debate has been going on forever and you know you have a room of just like you were saying john we have 500 people in the room we've got 30 people lined up on each side that have not yet spoken and it looks like everyone has repeated every argument uh several times already and no one's bringing up any new information they just want to state their piece yeah, you can there. call the question and end the debate Yay. because it's not really adding any value okay so I, that's what i've heard then is somebody doing that it's like can we be done with this all right good so there is a there is a way to stop the the horror right. yes <laughs> if the majority does not want to listen to this go on they can stop it so that's how it's done um if you make a motion like uh, i move that we have a booth at the county fair this year uh once it's seconded and the motion is repeated by the chair it is you're entitled to speak so first so you get to lay out your argument about why you need a booth at the state fair um there is no such thing as gaveling through a measure. So those of you who have seen the uh, the state convention in Nevada from 2016 saw the chair gavel through a couple of times, I believe. Uh, that's not appropriate behavior. Um, and the right of members to debate cannot be cut off by the chairs attempting to put the question. So again, if you only have the room until four o'clock and the chair is starting to get nervous about you know having to pay an extra hours rental for the room or whatever it's still not appropriate for the chair to uh to put the question and end debate um you know we continue to put up with uh a similar situation at at the standing committee meetings in the democratic party of oregon at the air at the quarterly meetings they schedule a one-hour meeting that should be two hours long and we get to the end of the first hour and 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 some staffer walks in and says oh you got to end the meeting the the next group's ready to meet and they're outside the door and they want to come in the, the 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 group meeting does not have to adjourn they can they can they can adjourn and readjourn somewhere else um they can they can recess and readjourn somewhere else but they do not have to end the meeting unless a majority of them agree to and so far a majority of the rules committee has gone along with this. Um, uh, at the next meeting, I've suggested that we schedule three hours because we have a lot of material to cover. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens if they try to shut us down again. Um, you know, the reasons why they want to shut us down is so we don't talk about things like uh, throwing legislators off the executive committee of the Democratic Party of Oregon because people will feel awkward or embarrassed. and. Uh, Sorry, but you know, if the membership wants to do that, that is their prerogative. Yeah, that won you a lot of brownie points. I was reading an article on that one. Yeah. But that's democracy. It's 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 not neat and clean, as somebody said earlier, right? This is what it takes. So length and number of speeches. Um, if no special rule exists relating to the length of speeches, a member can speak for no longer than 10 minutes unless they obtain consent of the assembly. And so maybe you have a really great speaker uh, who has been speaking passionately for 10 minutes about why you need a booth at the state fair. And if the group wants to hear 10 more minutes of them talking about this, they can allow them to do so. But if the group doesn't allow, doesn't agree to that, then the speaker has to stop. So, you know, hopefully within 10 minutes, you can get your arguments conveyed. <laughs> And the final note here is the rights in regard to debate are not transferable. So, um, uh, you know, the Senate um, and of Congress and the House of Representatives have their own rules of order, and you've probably seen them transfer their, their minutes. So the chair will say, everyone has three minutes to speak. And, and so you have the first speaker going, well, you know, blah, blah, blah for one minute. And, uh, and they will say, and I yield my remaining two minutes to the, the gentlewoman from Maryland. Um, that is not a rule of order under Robert's Rules of Order. That's something specific to how the, the Congress runs. So if you have 10 minutes to debate and you've t spoken for five, uh, and but you know your friend can talk forever, you cannot say, I yield my remaining five minutes to the gentleman from Jackson County. Um, 
your, your the balance of your ten, 10 minutes uh, expires. Hey, I'm going to rudely interrupt because Schultz is all fired up about this and wants to go get the rule book and start reading on his own. But can you tell everybody again where to go so they can sign up for your um, virtual discussion group and, and really stay connected? Um, so the, the, um, the best place to sign up is a uh, acronym called pdpo.org. And what I have there are a sign up to join the study group. Um, I have a button to click if you want to take one of the exams so we can make arrangements for you. And then I have links to both the Oregon Association of Parliamentarians and the National Association of Parliamentarians. So it's dpdo.org. It's pdpo. pdpo. pdpo.org. Thank you. P like parliamentarian. Uh, link, and then also under length and number of speeches, um, unless a special rule provides otherwise, this is the next slide, uh, members can speak no more than twice to the same question on the same day. So if your chair is, a, is not doing a good job and you have two people going at it and they have spoken for more than twice, then you need to raise your hand and say point of order, uh, I believe the uh, the the members from South Slope have exhausted their opportunities to speak, and the chair should shut them down. This also would help control the length of meetings. No one likes meetings that go on forever, uh, and periodically you see meetings devolve into a discussion between two people that are very passionate about something, and the rest of the room that has as beyond beyond caring about this topic, but. The rule is that no one should speak more than twice. And if you've never enforced a rule like this, it's probably a good idea to talk about this before you uh, spring it on them, because then they, they think like their rights are being taken away, um, uh, even though it says it flat out in the book. But, you know, I when I run meetings, I like to explain things in advance so everyone understands what the rules are, and then you don't have riots break out. Just... A couple thoughts on that, because I love this. Basically, what you're saying is two annoying people, you can shut the, the hell up. <laughs> but um, uh, is there like just a, like a top 10 list of basic rules? It sounds to me like maybe at the meeting that needs to be up as an, on an overhead, right? Here's the, here's the basic rules. Two times to speak, this and that, this and this, uh, right? Do you have one of those or is there, is there one? Do you think that's a good idea? I do not. That is a great idea. Um, I know I've done that in the past, and I did that with uh, uh, the class of county Democrats a couple of meetings ago, just so everyone understood the ground rules. Sweet. Um, uh, we just, you know, this this is the month where all the precinct committee persons take their positions for the next two years, and there's been an influx of new people, and so this would be a really great topic to review all across the state and all of the, the county party meetings, because you're going to have new people there. You will have people who are completely unfamiliar with this stuff, and it would be so great if they understood the rules so they can effectively participate. Yeah, and um, Schultze has a question. Uh, great, no, this is Dennis, I'm sorry. Question from Germany, and this is a good question, and maybe this is in Mason's rules. How long, how, who, how, who regulates how long Congress peoples gets to speak, everybody up there? Uh, or do you know how long they get to speak? <laughs> Well, what, what they seem to do is they, um, when they go into one of these, um, uh, especially something that's contentious, the, the rules committee gets together and they formulate the rules for that topic. So uh, if you've earlier, uh, I, I, I don't know if it was the immigration issue or if it was the issue before that, uh, they said, we're going to allocate three days for debate and the rules are going to be uh, you can speak for three minutes um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and they, they, they kind of make up the rules depending on the topic and the, you know, where they are in the election cycle and a, a bunch of variables. But they make up the rules in advance so everyone knows what to follow. OK, so this um, is this is like when they said we're only going to debate Obamacare for a million years and we're only going to debate the wall never or whatever. And like, <laughs> right. When they set those kind of things. Yes. OK. So unfortunately. And again, uh Congress, you know, the we the United States of America was the first democracy that was fabricated out of out of nothing, right? And that's why it was so revolutionary. And so, uh, 
what Jefferson did, because he was the vice, the first vice president, and he was in charge of the Senate. The first thing he did was he sat down and studied what went on in Parliament and came up with the first rules of order for the Senate. And the Constitution actually says both houses comes up with their own rules. So the House also had someone doing an equivalent exercise on their side. And it's those rules that they modify. You know, one of the things that they modified in the past couple of years is the number of votes taken to confirm a Supreme Court justice. If you remember, the, uh, the last one the Republicans did is they reduced it down to a majority from, uh, from 60 votes to confirm. Um, and that's how they think they're going to ram through the current uh, appointee. But they did that because they can do that because a majority of the Republicans agreed to change the rule. And they can do that because they control the House and Senate, which sucks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good answer. Thank you. Um, decorum in debate. So this goes back to calling people bootlickers. Um, you need to confine your remarks to the merits of the pending question. Uh, refrain from attacking a member's motive. Um Address all remarks through the chair. So if you are in debate and you're looking at the person who just last spoke or, you know, someone who, who's at the meeting that you loathe, that is not appropriate. You should be speaking through the chair. So the whole idea is that you are bringing facts and thoughts into the meeting, not emotions, and you're presenting it to the chair and everyone else is listening to the debate. What if the person is an asshat and it's a fact? Uh... It might be, but that's not, it's not a decorous thing to do to point that out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I can see the strain of these meetings are going to be tough for you, John. This is why um, I do what I do, and I don't <laughs> spend a lot of time in meetings. <laughs> yeah. um, avoid the use of members' names. This is why you see in Congress people refer to the gentleman from Alabama or the gentlewoman from uh, Vermont. Um, they don't talk about people's names because that personalizes the comments and you don't want you you don't want to piss people off. You want to keep the debate rational. Okay, but you just used a descriptive gentleman. So that means I could be like the Nazi from, you know, Nevada or right? I think we both know the difference. Okay. Fine. <laughs> just just levity. That's all. The the term gentleman is not well, I mean, there are people who, when I use the term ma'am to someone that's like, you know, under 30, then they get all ruffled. They should. Um, well, you... Sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to be polite. I'm gonna, you know, Showing your age there, Larry. <laughs> showing my age. Give me a break. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have to be very careful about how you use any kind of terminology in referring to anybody. It's true. The I... person from Alabama. And, and this is hard for, I think, angry Americans. The reason I really want to bring it up with decorum is because angry Americans right now are like, really? Really, you're asking us to be all nice and talk. You call you gentlemen and bullshit while you're like murdering people and, and bombing seven nations and putting babies in cages. But the problem is, is Larry's right about the breakdown of logic, rational conversation. You, you really got to keep the emotion out of it as much as possible to, to maintain rationality, even though you're dealing with assholes. Going into Mexican restaurants where people have been throwing Mexicans out of the country and, and disturbing their dinner. Uh, is not covered by Robert's Rules of Order, so go, go for it. There you go. That's fight it in the streets. Um, real quick, just to mention for Mike McCabe, um, extraordinary, wonderful guy who has like a massive amount of views on our on our uh, interview. Love to have Mike back. And it looks who was saying that they just talked to him? Um, was it Schultze? Um, and he gave a shout out to Uphill Media. So thank you, Mike. Looking forward to talking to you again. You're like some crazy phenomenon out there in w Wisconsin. So talk to you soon. All right, back to you. Uh, and the final one is re refrain from disturbing the assembly. So don't take your bag of Cheetos and sit in the middle of the meeting and start crunching away when people are trying to focus on um, the debate. Oh, so many good ideas oh, man. coming out of that. <laughs> so rules against the chair's participation. Uh, you know, chairs have feelings too. And uh, however, if they can't be impartial, they shouldn't be a chair. Um, chair, the chair should have nothing to say on the merits of pending questions. The chair is there to run the debate and make sure that everyone gets to speak their piece, but do that impartially. Um, to participate in debate, there's rules about this. So the chair must relinquish 
the chair, uh, which is the, you know, what is called the person that's running the presiding officer, and turn it over to either the highest ranking vice chair who has not spoken on the question. So, um, you know, if Jean, the chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon, wants to speak on something, she's more than welcome to, but she has to turn this over to our first vice chair, Valdez Bravo, if he has not spoken on this issue. However, if he's already spoken on this issue as well, or has made his intentions known, so he's no longer perceived as unbiased, then they would turn it over to Lupita, who's the second vice chair. And then assuming that she has not made her feelings known about something, then she could preside while the chair joins the assembly in the end the debate. Uh, comment from the peanut gallery, Jeffrey Pearson, no chairs were thrown in this video. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, if they can't find an officer to do this, then they need to find someone qualified to run the meeting in the, in the assembly. And hopefully there's someone who's, who's familiar enough with this stuff that they could, they could take over presiding. And the presiding officer should not return to presiding the meeting until the pending main question has been disposed of. So if they want to debate, then they go out and, and sit in with the other members until that motion has been uh, disposition, and then they can go back and take over the meeting again. So that's the end of that chapter. Any final questions? No questions. Just everybody's really excited about what they're learning here. And, and uh, uh, Schultz is talking about how he was in chat with Mike McCabe dissing the president. And uh, I mean, yeah, you got a lot of people excited. We got 20 people watching right now. 74 playbacks. Thank you all for being here um, and, and learning more about your democracy. And thank you, Larry, for teaching us this stuff that we were supposed to learn in school. Yes. So once again, uh, we would be delighted if you would join our new electronic unit. Um, um, so uh, if you go to uh, PDPO uh, and sign up, we will have your contact information and we will get you roped into this. Um, the parliamentarians are actually the most polite group of people I've ever come across in my life. I went to the convention last year, and I'm going to the convention this coming September um, to learn more about this from the core people. The last convention was really cool because the descendants of Roberts, General Roberts, was was at the meeting and and uh, and spoke to the assembly. Um, so we would love for you to join the group and start disseminating this information because uh, we are a a um, uh, uh, a country founded on the rule of law. And, and so either we follow the rules or we turn into the rest of the world where you resort to guns and knives, and we don't want to do that. So uh, it's best if we can follow the rules of order, and this is the topic which addresses that. Um, the next session that we have is going to be on the core principles of parliamentary procedure, because unless you understand those, uh, the rest of the uh, material uh, doesn't make as much sense. And I'm, I realize that when I put this together, that these underlying concepts have to be understood before uh, you, can, you, you can fully understand the, uh, the other topics. And really, that's something that you have to get down in order to really pass the exams. Because if you understand the underlying concepts, you can, you can understand what the the, the tests are getting at when they have these questions that seem like they're all the same.